Um, hi everyone. For those of you that don't know me, I am Aliyah Pandolfi, the Executive Director of Cashmere World Foundation. And um, our team has worked with a lot of you here today, but um, this presentation will be done by um, Professor Oleg. And one of the reasons why we're interested in um, public thrusters is because uh, for our wildlife conservation work, one of the main things that I try to do is find a way to reduce, reduce noise pollution in the wildlife conservation areas that we're working at. So <clears throat> this has been brought to my attention as one of the more acoustically acceptable, perhaps, methods of being able to incorporate into drones, which will reduce the noise for us whether it's to not disturb the wildlife that live in the parks that we work in or to not alert the poachers that we're trying to find as well. So I'm pretty excited to hear Oleg your presentation today and um, learning from you and figuring out like how our team and people we're collaborating with on this project might be able to um, benefit from the research that you and your team have put together. So maybe we could start with a quick introduction. Oleg, you can go first and then maybe we'll put down the list and those of you that would like to introduce yourself and kind of share where you are um, and your interest in the helpless thrusters. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Ole Gusha, and uh, currently I am in uh, Newport News, Virginia. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about me later, so I'll let us go around the circle here with introductions. <laughs> So may I introduce myself? Yes, please, Kapel. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm Kapil Devaregmi. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Advanced College of Engineering and Management here in Nepal. We have a school and other management college also. Uh, and um, uh, we are really thankful to Aleha for this opportunity and our interest, uh, since we run engineering colleges here in Nepal, and we would be really happy having Kashmir World Foundation in Nepal. And we would like to partner here in Nepal and uh, promote uh, whatever Kashmir World Foundation is doing in the US and other countries, we will bring it to Nepal also. And we will be very happy to cooperate, to facilitate from our part. Thank you. Thank you, Kapal. I guess uh, if it's okay, could I also introduce myself? Yes, please. Um, well, my name is Vigo Slutel. I am a an intern for Kashmir World Foundation. Just joined today, really. Um, I was told by Aliyah to come here and check out the conference and everything. Um, I too was born in Nepal, just like a uh, Kapil as well. But I am now in Columbus, Ohio, and I am more or less interested in like uh, in deep learning and like the AI aspect of. Uh, you know, just the different things that Kashmir does, but I wanted to, to, you know, take a look and listen to about these new research that you guys are doing as well. Thanks, babes. Hey, I'll introduce us. This is Mark Moore and Yasa Kueki. So we're, uh, we just both left uh, Uber Elevate after four years um, and uh, we started up a company called Whisper Arrow that's focused on ultra low noise uh, propulsion. Hi everyone. Welcome guys. Hi guys. Um, I'm Robin Donald. I've also recently uh, left Uber Elevate and um, am in San Luis Obispo and uh, looking to see what's next. Hey guys. Hi, Mark. Hey, Rob. I see a few familiar faces there. <laughs> um, well, my name's Rich Ouellette, and um, a part of the, the discussion we were having this last week uh, was on some of the efforts that we were doing with NASA and the aquifer program where we had a rim-driven motor in there and we had some nano electric fuel cells and some super soul. Um, I was, uh, I, I'm also kind of going from someplace to someplace. So I retired from Boeing after about 32 years couple of months ago. 
thrown in there was the uh, North American aircraft buyout. And I had some time with Northrop and at Wright Patterson back in 79. So I've been around a little bit, working electric since about 2008 uh, on an ADEPT program with DARPA, which translated into uh, another program with AFRL, again, with uh, electrics and rim motors, that type of thing. And then there was some activity in 2012 in NASA and, and Sugar. And um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see what some of the new research is going on. I don't see Bobby on the list yet. So if I don't see him pop up soon, he may not have gotten your, um, oh, there he is. I was gonna say he may not have gotten the update. So uh, look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> Alan, good to see you. Yeah. yeah, how you doing? It's been a while. It has. We're just doing quick introductions, so you joined right sure. on time. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. I was having a little bit of computer problems. I don't know what's going on with my desktop, but managed it on my laptop. So I'm good. Um, and some of our other people here are going to be joining us as well. Um, so uh, yeah, Chris Ruiz and um, Doreen, I think, is calling in. I'm not sure if she's there yet or not. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, everybody, nice to meet you all. I'm Alan Taylor, the president of Rapid Composites. And some of our uh, uh, great engineers uh, from our company are joining us as well. We're uh, um, real excited about it. And it looks, uh, looks like there's some that we might actually have some applications for this. So we're, we're real interested to see what you got. Thanks, Alan. Alex. Stahl. Hi, Alex Stahl from JB Aviation. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with us, we're doing uh, electric manned uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft for transportation, but, um, you know, just trying to keep abreast of all the new developments and, um, you know, hear what uh, you guys are working on, what you guys have to say. So thanks for presenting. Thanks, Alex. Alexander? Hi hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much for letting me join. Uh, my name is Alexander Sullivan. Uh, Dr. Horsha is my mentor and I'm currently doing uh, research uh, with Dr. Horsha on uh, wind, wind process and I am a senior mechanical engineering student uh, at the City College of New York. So thank you for letting me join. Awesome, welcome, thanks for being here. All right, let's see, Virgin, hey. Uh, sorry, I'm on a crowded place. Uh, but do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm Butchan. I'm an assistant professor of industrial engineering at Texas A&M University Commerce. Uh, I, I research on drones. That's why I'm here. Nice to meet you. Thanks for being here, Virgin. Chris Ruse. That's your, your guy, Alan, right? Yeah, Chris Ruiz. Yeah, he's one, one of our mechanical engineers. You got your microphone off there, Chris. Hey guys, how's it going? Good, thanks Chris. <laughs> hey, I just, um, <clears throat> Alan had mentioned the webinar was going on and uh, was saying that would probably be a good opportunity to, to listen in on what, what you guys are presenting and uh, how we can help you out. Awesome, thank <clears throat> you for being here. Jay, go yeah, watch. It has been a while. Hey, happy to yeah, sure has. Uh, <laughs> wow, it's uh, so good to see you. Oh, likewise. Uh, can't wait to hear uh, this presentation. I'm uh, working on a new airplane that could probably use it. So, um, so I, I'm uh, Jay Gunlack, uh, president of Gunlack Aerospace. Jerry, Rapid Composites. Where is Bobby? Hey, I don't know if you can hear me or not. This is Jerry from uh, Rapid Composites. Uh, I'm a mechanical designer, work with Alan. We've really been looking forward to uh, to this uh, webinar. and can't wait to see what you guys got. Hey, awesome. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, abbreviation, JM. All right, I'm going to pass on that. Copy. 
Hi, uh, hi everyone. It's uh, Kavi from Germany. Uh, I'm currently a student pilot at Ostanza Group, and I look forward to be part of this presentation and to hear what you uh, what you would like to present. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Kavi. Mike. Mike Barnes. Okay. Prina. Prina, Dr. Bhattacharya. Yeah, Bhattacharya. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Prina Bhattacharya and good morning to all. Uh, it's early morning here, it's 4.45. And, so sorry, uh, good evening. Good that is really early for you guys in Nepal. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, it's great. Uh, sometimes it's nice to wake up early, it's fresh. So I'm very happy to meet you all. I'm joining in behalf of Advanced Engineering College and I'm very excited to see what's happening in the webinar and look forward to the exciting research and the presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, Rob Thompson. Hey, how's it going guys? Uh, Rob Thompson here. I'm a third generation commercial pilot. I've trained around 3,000 drone pilots, former lobbyists for government affairs. I led the effort on banning DJI drones in the U.S. and I also helped write legislation for 333's Part 107 license. Currently a technology advisor for the Office of the Secretary and fighting COVID-19 as a compliance officer, busting frauds and scoundrels globally. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, Tim Street. Hi, I'm Tim. I worked on Hubless Thrusters a few years ago now um, as part of the GHO program. So I'm curious to see where the technology has gone since I've been out of the game. All right. Thanks for being here, Tim. By the way, I thought I heard Bobby, but I don't see him on my list. Bobby, are you here? I guess not. Um, all right. Well, then, in that case, um, I'll like. We'll let you take charge now. All right. Well, let me share my screen. Uh, first of all, uh, again, Alias, uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for the introductions. Uh, I'm excited to present to such a diverse and uh, group of people from all, all over uh, the world and different industries. It's uh, truly an honor to be here and present to everybody. And um, let's uh, keep it, you know, less, uh, uh, more, more, more informal. So if you want to interrupt me and jump in and comment and uh, ask questions, I'll be happy to be interrupted because A, it's uh, what, 6 p.m. here. So, um, you know, I, I need to, we need to wake up those people that are across the world and uh, 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m. folks there. So let's pick them up a little bit. Um, so the uh, title of the talk is Render and Thruster Dynamic and Acoustic Preliminary Analysis. And I will, uh, I will um, uh, use the slides that we presented at AIAA in the summer. Um, I know I actually attended the presentation for the aquifer project. So I'm, I know that a lot of you are well familiar with rim driven thrusters. And uh, quite honestly, I'll, I'll say that in, on our end, the project is still in its infancy. So we're probably not as, as, as far along as some of you might have uh, already gotten, but I'll show you what we got and I'll show you what we're working on right now. And uh, we'll go from there. Um, so first thing here is, uh, the background is uh, an image that I took, a picture that I took in California. This is Sierra Nevada Mountains. And uh, I thought I used it for my title slide just to kind of take our, uh, you know, everybody's around the world in different uh, conditions right now, but I believe most of us are stuck at home. So it's good to kind of get away from, uh, from uh, our home offices and look at into the distance here, although a little bit foggy. Um, so, this is uh, Sierra Nevada in California. California is where I finished my uh, uh, bachelor master's degree in University of California, Irvine in the aerospace. And, um, and then I went to do my um, 
doctorate degree at City College of New York. And since then, I was teaching and doing research between City College in New York and Manhattan College. So if you are uh, familiar with Manhattan, here's uh, island of Manhattan, New York City. In the middle, we have our Central Park. And um, this is the Midtown. This is where you see all the tall buildings here. So City College is in, in Harlem, in the historical district of Harlem. And when I say that uh, we are from Manhattan College, a lot of folks assume that we are, you know, the 150th floor overlooking the skyline of Manhattan, which is actually not true. Uh, Manhattan College is way right here. It's actually not even in Manhattan uh, at all. It's actually in, uh, uh, on the border of uh, Bronx, Bronx and Riverdale. So uh, being a, a engineering building is actually in Bronx which gives us a little bit of a street credit there. So that's, that's something cool that we can brag about. Um, so we are doing this research right now between kind of Manhattan College and City College, because uh, as you'll see, we're using the, um, the wind tunnel at City College in close collaboration there. And uh, Alex, my student who introduced himself, uh, is at City College. Um, I am an adjunct professor at Manhattan College because right now I'm doing, uh, I'm working for, uh, or since December, I'm actually working for NASA doing some wind, wind tunnel testing. So I've, uh, I heard a lot of you said that you're in transition period. I'm in the transition period myself. We're moving to NASA right now for, for more wind tunnel testing. Um, hence the, also the room is a bit echoey because it's a, it's a completely empty room in the brand new, uh, place. So, all right. Well, like I said, we're going to present something for, that we uh, we talked about uh, at AIAA, and I added some slides here and there, so to show you a little bit of uh, more information that we had. Uh, this research, in particular, was conducted with um, with uh, my students Max Hassan uh, from uh, Manhattan College, and Hassan is currently uh, at University of Buffalo. So I know a lot of you are familiar with rim-driven thrusters, and maybe for those of you who aren't, I will just show you what it is. It's a thruster, it's a propeller driven at its rim. So hence rim-driven thruster. And these have been widely used in marine application um, for, there's several benefits of, the, of this. One of the benefits is that, uh, quite easy construction that can be waterproof. So you can uh, uh, isolate the rotor from the stator quite easily and make the, the whole assembly waterproof and that uh, benefits the, in the marine application. Um, there have, have been a research that shows that it's uh, more efficient in uh, incompressible flow, but as a lot of the participants here have noted that we're doing uh, drones in the air and uh, uh, one of my colleagues said that pretty much pretty soon there's going to be so many drones that we won't be able to see the sun, which is probably true. So, uh, so hence, we want to apply this in uh, compressible fluid. So we want to see what's happening in the compressible fluid. And um, a lot of work on the noise on the acoustics, which is of interest here to a lot of folks, is uh, been done actually here at Langley. And uh, one of the uh, noise sources that that this rim drone thr thruster benefits from is not having a supporting structure to to support the uh, motor in the center line. So we, we eliminate the the motor in the center line, and we excite the propeller into rotation uh, at its outer radius at its rim. Then uh, we have we don't have these supporting structures and. Uh, Folks have been studying this particular source of, of, of sound, and there's others that, that we can talk about the, uh, the trailing vortices, uh, ac acoustic signature from the conventional propellers. Again, we can hypothesize that in the rim driven thr thrust application, because the outer edge is terminated by a rim, you essentially eliminate the, any trailing vortices and eliminate any source of noise, uh, that particular uh, noise source. So 
So there is, has, has been some work done on these room during thrusters in uh, compressible flow application. Uh, Bolam and Vagapov, uh, they, they constructed a, a prototype. Again, aquifer project, uh, you, you have folks uh, constructed a prototype. So th there's uh, obviously a work done on these. And um, uh, we wanted to dive into this as well um, for our own reasons. So let me show you what we have done over the past uh, two, or th two years or so. Uh, two, three years. Um, but the main objective of our prototype was to perform some of these aerodynamic and acoustic studies. Uh, and again, uh, I'll reiterate that we're a little bit in, in, in the infancy of this uh, entire uh, project. So still working on this. So I'll agree explain how we designed the, the, the machine and then I'll talk about some of the results here and uh, I'll also comment with the fact that we weren't immune to the whole COVID lab closures. I see a lot of you are, are currently present in the labs which I envy. Uh, I miss the lab environment. Um, okay so the way we conducted the we, we designed this uh, prototype is we used the the regular brushless uh, motor configuration. So we have three coils, a north, south, and the sense. And um, we multiplied this by four to give us a continuous distribution of forcing around the circle. And uh, each one of these coils then we mounted on a ABS 3D printed frame, like so. So that is our stator. That's what stays in place and now for our uh, for our uh, rotor we machined a teflon rim and inside this teflon rim we we uh, in, enclosed permanent magnets so we have uh, uh, north south north south magnets uh, embedded into this teflon now the reason for why we choose the teflon is because in this particular design that i'm showing here we we were thinking to use these uh, also machined out of Teflon, what we call boots, so that the Teflon rim, due to its low coefficient of resistance, would just smoothly glide over the boots and that, that's what keeps the entire fan concentric and yet uh, minimizes the friction. And as you'll see here pretty, pretty quickly is that uh, because the outer, because this is uh, action is happening at the outer radius of the, of the fan, the tangential speed here is quite large. So um, this was in the end, not an ideal design. Um, and inside we could put, it, put in any airfoil geometry we want. So we tested a bunch of different airfoils. We uh, put in artificially the hub here. We put in different treatments of the uh, tips here. And that's actually what we're studying right now. So that's the configuration of the uh, prototype that we're, we were one of them that we, we constructed. And um, we have two that we really kind of dove in and studied. We actually have quite, quite a bit more uh, constructed in, in the end, but the, these two were the most successful ones. So this one is the one that I just explained. Uh, we have our airfoils, we have the Teflon rim here, uh, ABS printed frames and our uh, coils. And we connect this all to a commercially available ESC uh, and the battery pack. So did not do any of the electronics there yet. Um, this was one of the earlier uh, prototypes that I wanted to discuss here. And uh, again, you can see that we, we use the bearings to keep the fan concentric. And again, I'll show you that that was not as, uh, as pleasant as we expected it to be. So 10 what's centimeter diameter. diameter is... Somebody had a question? Yeah, what's the diameter on these? Uh, so 13 diameter here and the 10 centimeter diameter. So these, these, these are small, these are small. Um, and uh, 2000 RPM and 4000 RPM. So again, we did not run them uh, again terribly high, which is, which is uh, one of the reasons why our noise signature was, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, any other questions? Because uh, I can talk for, for a long time without Letting others talk. So I have a question. How anybody wants to? <clears throat> I have a question. How did you decide on um, the size of it, and then how many coils would go on each, um, like the 10, 10 inch versus the thirteen inch? Is this the same amount of 
magnets and coils that you have on there or does that vary and if so what was the reasoning for that distance of that yeah that's that's an excellent question so we went with the uh, same configuration that the vagapov and uh, and his team used and we focused on um on on having a, a more or less a formula to um to size the size of the, the the design of the coils themselves so how you know uh, how much how many turns we can do what's the diameter of the wire so we, we, we're trying to balance the uh, um, the uh, current aspect of it with with the cogging torque here um, so we we took the already available the other so we didn't um, although we did we did do uh, 24 uh, coils and and so on and on so we did actually try a bunch of different a bunch of different things but uh, th this this showed to be the most uh, uh, the most promising for what we're doing here with the sizes that we're talking about any other questions okay again feel free to well, interrupt me question. I can ask another question. How did you decide on the shape of your um, like inner blades or propellers, whatever you, you're calling them? That How did is, you decide on that? that? That is an excellent question. And if you don't mind, I will address this a little bit later because that is our current, uh, Alex is actually working on this and uh, I'll, I'll answer that question in just a second. Um, or a minute or half an hour. Okay. So I I had one real quick too. Sorry to sorry no to worries, yeah. I had my microphone off. Sorry. Um uh, did you do this with any was this just a, a university sponsored program or did you do like a, a STTR grant for the research on this? Is there any government partners or um, private partners involved in this? Uh, no private partners, no government. We did get some help from uh, from one company to do this. Uh, so it, it was a funded uh, project, but it wasn't a big uh, grant from the government or, or DOD or anything like that, no. Okay. Yeah. We, we might be interested in helping you on uh, future fabrication efforts on this uh, in composites. Oh, that would be that would be great. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. We could have uh, much higher RPMs with the stuff that we do. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why I'm uh, excited to present to 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 everybody involved here. And, uh, okay, so um, you have seen it operating basically. This is um. Uh, from start until you can see that, that we have the leads going to our ESC and uh, looks like a beautiful donut shaped uh, propeller there. Um, okay, so let me just jump in and, and give you a couple of metrics here. Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this uh, propeller into a half and then what we have done is well, or what I'll, I'll show you here is a couple of scans with the hot wire downstream of the um, of the fan for different uh, radial locations. So from the center line, which is R R zero to almost hundred percent, and um, this was done at the City College wind tunnel. So we've uh, positioned the the, the the prototype in the middle of the test section, and it it's it's a what is it four by four foot square test section and uh, you know, I, I don't remember how many feet downstream, but in the back there, you can see the uh, fan of the tunnel. Um, and we moved it out of the any boundary layer interaction. And you can see that there is a hot wire holder right there in, in the back here. So the, this picture is taken from the from the front, from the inlet of the of the tunnel uh, towards the uh, towards the back. It's an open circuit wind tunnel. Uh, so that's what we use for the some of the aerodynamic studies and. Um, then we also wanted to see what happens downstream. How does the wake develop downstream of the of the uh, prototype? And this is where, uh, as 
was unexpected. Uh, the virus hit and the lab was shut down. So we had to do some numerical studies for, uh, for this. So I'll, I'll be mixing the experimental studies with some numerical uh, work. And then we also were interested in the, we wanted to take, a, to take a look at the acoustic signature of this whole uh, thing. So again, we used the just generic microphone. And uh, um, one of the interesting things that I'll tell you is that our lab is uh, right next to a subway line. So um, uh, if, if you've been to New York City, you know that subways, when they run above the ground, they're terribly loud, unnecessarily loud. Uh, so we, we tried our best to build an, an echoic chamber and uh, eliminate some of the ambient noise and the echoes uh, from from everything, which this kind of helped. But uh, we still had to time our uh, data collection. We had to sync it with the schedule of the of, of the subway, essentially. Um, Okay, so let me look at the velocity, just the time series down, down, downstream of the fan. So in this picture, the, the flow would be from left to right, and, and then we're positioning the hot wire at different radial locations. And as expected, right in the center line, you see this really clean signal, no perturbations, no fluctuations. Uh, so this is definitely a, a first benefit of the rim-driven thruster over a, a hub thruster. And as you march it out into the outer, radius you start seeing the blade passage frequencies and they become more and more dominant and uh, up until you reach the outer rim where you have this uh, more chaotic behavior because of the shear layer formation downstream of the frame and and the solenoids and uh, all the supporting structures so this is kind of an expected behavior here um, so the uh the, the variation of the uh, so I'm, what I'm plotting here is the uh, acceleration factor essentially uh, the, the radial average of the radial velocity divided by the incoming free stream velocity for different free stream velocities so this is essentially the free stream uh, scan and what uh, again as you increase the free stream velocity the acceleration factor uh, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller uh, but there's two interesting areas here to, to focus on. So the acceleration factor is probably as expected highest at around 70% of the radius. And you see this little bump here in the center line. And this is actually what, what we're, this is real, and this is what we're trying to focus on right now. So I'll dive into that just a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, again, to march downstream of the fan, we had to jump to the uh, numerical simulations. And since we had a numerical uh, model, we might as well just uh, throw in this, uh, uh, we retain the geometry of the airfoils, remove the, the rim and put, put in this artificial hub just to recreate the kind of the conventional double peaked uh, uh, profile, velocity profile downstream of a, of a conventional propeller. And uh, as we march downstream to 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, we see that the wakes uh, merge and you have this double, double peak profile uh, with uh, nearly no, um, uh, well, not nearly no wake, but the wake will eventually dis disappear. So this is expected. We wanted to see how this compares to the uh, rim-driven thruster. Um, so we uh, put in our model of the rim-driven thruster and um, uh, you can see that downstream, directly downstream of the fan, you, you see this sideways Batman looking profile. And again, in the center line, you see this acceleration here bump. So this is a real thing. We've seen it in experimental work and we see this in the computational work. And um, so going back to uh, Aliyah, your question, how do we design the, 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 the blades here? What we're focusing now is uh, to try to design the blade, the tip of the blade, such that we amplify this uh, this peak. So we, it's been we have strong evidence that uh, if you are careful about how you terminate the blade here, you can amplify this peak and uh, almost eliminate this this uh, this this wake here. Um, and some some per person suggested that you can double triple the thrust this way. 
so that's kind of moving forward. So um, how many different possible. designs of the blades have you guys already worked with and compare the results? With different design of, of the tip, we're just diving into there. So okay. where we haven't done any tip treatment yet, we have uh, conceptual designs and we're we're trying to actually, as we as we speak, to test them out. So. So yeah, that's uh, the tip design is in the works. The uh, the geometry of the of the blades that's kind of a trivial question there. It's um, and then you said these were three D printed, right? Correct. So yeah, then, correct. depending on the materials, like Alan is the material specialist here, it that yeah. could also help with reducing that bump also. Exactly. Like that, exactly. And what we've done is we've. Um, we epoxy coat um, the the blades for one to to give them a little bit more strength because we've seen them fly apart and they uh, stick into the into the wood you know about half inch half half inch uh, into the wood so these are can be dangerous so we we epoxy them to um, to uh, uh, to um, improve mechanical properties. Yeah, yeah, and then and then we can also sand the epoxy to to give it a little bit more uh, smoothness yeah. at a leading edge. And uh, yeah, have have you explored uh, winglets on the ends of uh, these blades by chance? Because often um, there's a significant I increase in uh, yeah or, or reduction in the um, uh, drag coefficient on you know wing surfaces when winglets are added. Um, Plus, you increase your surface area. Um, you know, now that you have eliminated the hub, uh, you can uh, utilize some of that space for potentially a feature that that might might give you some uh, uh, aerodynamic and acoustic advantage. I would think. Um, uh, are you considering that right now? Yes, exactly. And maybe in in, in a month or a month and a half, I'll be able to exact uh, to. Give you a qual quantitative answer to, to 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 this. So yes, that's exactly what uh, different. Uh, going back to the designs, there's now the now we have a, uh, you know winglets, sharklets, uh, whatever you want uh, to, to put in there and to and to, but basically somehow turn the flow. So so we max we we create this core of energized flow through the center line. That's kind of the the key here. We're working on um, some marine applications right now, it so happens, and we're doing a CFD analysis, uh, actually many analyses, uh, plural, uh, on uh, actually in, uh, effectively a propeller, an impeller design. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of both. Uh, it can be um, modified into either or um, for a, a, a very successful customer in the marine market space. And uh, we're playing around with some of those very same issues, uh, in particular, uh, the acoustics. Um, yep. The acoustics of certain materials are um, create, uh, especially with the metallic structures, uh, they tend to create a zing that our customer absolutely cannot stand. So we're working out um, what the best materials and shapes and modifications to those shapes are to minimize that. So I think there could be some really good collaborations there. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the materials are something you really do want to look at on this um, because, you know, as I mentioned, you could definitely increase the RPM by going to more structural materials, but there are, there are some, uh, you know, you know uh, to make this carbon fiber is not really um, the easy answer. It's, it's what kind of carbon fiber, what type of molding process, what type of, um, uh, you know, process makes most sense, uh, but you you could probably achieve everything that you want to do um, in a scale model very easily. And um, yeah, we we can talk about it later. But I yeah, I I think when we got into this call, we were already anticipating helping you do that because we saw you were using a lot of rapid prototype materials that uh, that, that yeah. just aren't going to they're not going to they're not going to do the trick. I I agree 100% with you. Yeah, that yeah definitely will. Uh, um, and um, uh, again, it's uh, six six forty. I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm sorry. Comment on that. Uh, 
maybe the the five a.m. crew can can jump in and wake me up now. <laughs> okay. Uh, um. All right. Let me let let me um keep going here. There's no more comments and questions. Um. So again, you you go downstream. Oops, wrong wrong. You go downstream in the uh, in the profiles here, and this this peak. Uh, Dissipates, and we are, we recover our double peak profile that we've seen uh, downstream of a conventional propeller quite quickly. Um, so having the uh, both the experimental and computational work, uh, you, we could compare our results to make sure that kind of makes sense, and uh, they they come pretty close. There is a the experimental work underpredicts the uh, the. Uh, the velocities, but in both cases, again, we see that that there is an inter interesting thing is happening along the center line. So that gave us a little bit of confidence. And since we had the profiles, we uh, computed the uh, the uh, the net thrust at different velocities, and we used the blade element theory to to predict the uh, analytically how much uh, how much thrust we're getting. And you, you can see that they. So the black circles here is our experimental work, and the blade element theory is the black line here. So we can predict quite well uh, the peak here. The again, the C CFD underpredicted the velocities, and hence they're going to un underpredict the uh, the thrust. And the, moreover, the uh, the Hubless model was uh, suffered from the drag that the outer frame. Uh, experienced so because uh, unlike in the conventional propeller where you have drag on the hub which is relatively small area next to the center line now you have a whole rim at the outer radius so the, the net area that the, the pressure is acting on is quite big so so this is the, this turned out to be exactly the drag on the rim and uh, uh, and overall, we underpredicted with our experimental or with our theoretical model. Um, so the, a little bit more about the blade element theory. It's just a standard uh, blade element theory. I'm not going to uh, go too much into this, and I'll show you just some of our results from the computation, uh, computational work. Again, this is uh, we we needed to dive into this because the lab was shut down. So this is probably. Uh, uh, this we are improving in this right now, and I'm plotting here the Q criterion, um, the flow. The somebody had a question? No. Nope. Yeah, okay. I had a quick question for you. What was your design speed for the blades? Or are they? I mean, they look like they're twisted a bit. Um, so when you picked your blade twist. What was your intended speed? Was it for static flight, or did you have a flight speed in mind? Uh, so we we, uh, we we knew the RPM was uh, let's say what is it two thousand to four thousand RPM. So based on that, we used the uh, we rotated our blades on uh, four uh, four meters a second free stream velocity or something like that. The 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 wind tunnel that we have it goes from zero to ten meters a second. So we just Put it approximately at four meters a second free stream velocity was our design point. Okay. So, thank you. Uh, in this particular case, I'm not sure which which uh, which uh, which blades we use, but you see, you see that we 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 designed it for two meters a second uh, clearly. So so yeah, there is there is a there is a twist uh, to the geometry and uh, to account for uh, free stream and the rotational speed and all that. Um. Okay, so in the in the conventional propeller, we know that the, we're dominated by the tip vortices, and as we discussed before, you know the, we expect that from the uh, hubless rim-driven thruster, uh, we eliminate those uh, those vortices, and instead, so we don't see any red colors here. We don't see any tw twenty thousand Q value uh, ISO surfaces, but uh, we're seeing these much lower. Uh, vortex. They're not even vortex sheets. They resemble more of, or sorry, they're not vortex, uh, vortex, vortex streams, vortex tubes. They're they more resemble a uh, vortex sheet downstream, downstream, downstream of every single uh, blade. So as expected, we 
we know that this this is what's happening and this is again we're using some of these uh, cfd models now to try to turn the flow in the center line so now we're we're looking in the center line region to see what's happening how to better design the tip tip of these vortices um okay so let me dive in again these are these are preliminary uh data from the acoustic studies we used uh, just a conventional microphone upstream of the uh, of the propeller and uh, here are two uh, frequency spectrum for different designs here and i'll show you this this is a little bit explains the design process here um, so you can argue that there are some peaks here here that may be the late passing frequencies but uh, by the way we offset the green curve here, which corresponds to this design with the roller bearing, uh, at the roller bearings at the, at the outer radius, uh, and so so these are, these are this should be zero here. We just offset it for for visual clarity here. Um, so this is our first design, and we saw this high frequency noise, which after we dove into this a little bit deeper, is exactly the uh, noise from the bearings. So because they rotate so fast. Uh, due to the tangential contact of the outer radius here, uh, they produce this high frequency noise that uh, no drone will wanna will want to have. So that's why our first mission after we did tested this first prototype was to eliminate the ball bearings, and that's why we went with the glider uh, boots here at the outer radius to hopefully uh, eliminate the noise, and we indeed do that so you can see that this the noise signature from this design does not have any have any any frequencies at the higher end of the spectrum but um, you know not going to try to hide these these very very loud tones now in their uh, harmonics and what these are is um teflon uh, is a uh, soft material we primarily just started using it because of its low friction of coefficient but uh, what we didn't think about is uh, again within uh, 10 seconds of the runtime of these uh, fans these the teflon boots would just wear out and any concentric alignment of the fan would be lost and the fan would start vibrating so this is actually the fan hitting the frame and uh, again any 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 uh, hope to study the uh, blade, what's happening at the at, at the blades themselves was lost. Um, so, and just to convince ourselves that that's uh, kind of what it was, we 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 took out the fan, saw that there is no uh, broadband frequencies present. So this is the indeed the air motion through through the propeller, and then here's our again fan hitting the the frame. Uh, so. So again, we understood that we need to design this fan without any any, any uh, bearings, and hence comes in this our current design, which uh, now, if, if you look at this, this looks uh, a lot like aquifer uh, design, or not a design, but um, the picture that I've seen at the AIAA also has so this kind of rectangular frame, and uh, inside of it is our uh, magnets, so we have contact less, uh, frictionless uh, bearing system in there. So this is uh, what we're assembling right now and uh, going to be testing this uh, again quite soon. Hope If we can get a, a quiet test, then we can start uh, analyzing uh, some of the acoustic signature from these different blade designs. So right now we're still struggling to eliminate the noise from the, uh, from the friction. Um, so that's a... That's all I have for you uh, today. This uh, basically the, our, the, the state of our research at, as we presented it is we've uh, we've been trying to find to to create this prototype that is uh, consistently uh, runs consistently quiet, so we can perform some of these acoustic analysis and uh, hence also aerodynamics to improve the the uh, the blade tips tip design there. Um, so with that said, I would like to open up any floor or, or floor for any questions and comments and uh, discussion. How long did your research um, take? If you're new. Sorry, Tim. 
No worries. Tim, go on. Oh, um, so I was going to ask, uh, with the new contactless bearing, you, you're doing that magnetically? Is that all just with permanent magnets? Um, and follow on to that, what are you intending to push the tip mock number up to? Um, just back of the envelope, even at 4,100 RPM, you're still looking at um, very low tip mocks for airborne flight. And so I'm curious to see if you're going to push that up into reasonable thrust generation range for actual flying vehicles yeah so the uh permanent magnets yes uh the uh, the coils themselves do hold them the fan axially uh so there is not as much focus on having the axial uh thrust bearings um, as there is focus right now to align the fan concentrically. And yes, once we have something that, 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 that is quiet, that does not have any friction, noise from friction, uh, then yes, we do, we do intend to speed it up. Um, and the, again, the, our, our interest is, is more fundamental here. So yes, the uh, kind of goal here is one to one weight to thrust ratio, but we do want to fundamentally first understand how to turn the flow so that we can energize the center core. So yes, uh, we want to have a faster fan to produce some, some uh, usable thrust, but first we want to fundamentally understand what happens at the, at the inner radius of the, of, of the blade. Leah, you had a question? Yeah, I was asking uh, about your research. Did you say it took about two years to, to do this research or how long were you guys working on this? It, uh, we took, uh, yeah, yeah, two, one and a half years, I think, uh, before the, uh, the uh, AAAA. So we, we started from, from scratch, yeah. And have you considered air bearings for this? We did. We're we're still we're not set on that. Our that the final design will have these uh, magnetic uh, bearings. Uh, we're we're looking at the leaf bearings and and still contact bearings. So we're we're trying different different things out. Yes, air bearings. Yeah, a lot of it is uh, is we are uh, manufacturing as you might have uh, expected. It's our uh, limiting component here yeah i think alan could really help help you guys out with that because he's got yeah, the skills and capability to to do that and alan you said you've already been working on something similar for a submarine but or yeah. a, a marine based system so you're very familiar with how this would work but if we could find a way to take it into the air that would be awesome right yeah i um I guess I didn't uh, really use the opportunity in the introduction very well uh, in the beginning, but uh, just to let you all know, um, we're a, uh, my, my company's been around 21 years and we, uh, we work with both commercial and defense related uh, clients. We do, uh, we've been doing a lot of government work for many years, but we also do a lot of commercial work and the customer I mentioned is, is actually a, uh, consumer makes consumer products that are extremely successful. Um, uh, Aliyah, you got to see uh, the, uh, the foiling craft uh, when you were, uh, that's one of the products that we work on. Um, so uh, we, we do a lot of drones as well. Um, so we have in-house full engineering, um, everything from industrial design, mechanical engineering, uh, firmware and software and BIOS, uh, as well as uh, full electrical engineering capability. Um, and we have a master tool and die making operation. We mold carbon fiber um, pretty much across the board in 15 minutes or less, to give you an idea. Um, we specialize in really high speed manufacturing processes. 
So we have all the equipment and all the resources under one roof. Um, it's a highly robotic facility that uh, Alia has been to. Uh, and um, we're, uh, we've actually just added some machines here before the end of the year. And we too have had a few little impacts here and there with COVID, but for the most part, um, we haven't had any direct impacts, any direct hits in our company. We've managed to keep everybody very safe and uh, we allow our engineers to work remotely when they need to or feel they need to. Uh, but uh, our, our manufacturing operation is fully operational and um, we're, um, we're, we're focused on trying to keep everybody apart there since uh, I can't put a 30,000 pound machine on a kitchen table for some of my employees. Uh, does not work. So uh, we got to keep them really safe. Uh, but um, yeah, we'd love to help you. Um, I can I can already envision materials that we can make this out of. We are already, uh, we actually have two propeller designs that are pretty earth shattering right now that are undergoing CFD. Um, and um, that's ongoing, but uh, we have we have designs that are actually uh, in the manufacturing process right now, and they're going to be manufactured from carbon fiber. So um, that's you know we can reduce the spinning mass. Um, we can make them incredibly structural. Um, we can three D orient the fiber. Um, we uh, we can we could probably mold what you have designed there in um, in I would tell you with steel molds in less than a minute. So with the proper tooling. Yeah, Alan definitely has some impressive uh, equipment that I, I can attest to and capabilities as well. But I just noticed Bobby is on and Bobby, did I, are you still here? Yes. Bobby, we missed your inter introduction. You were one of the first persons I was introduced to who was working on a hubless thruster i'd love for you to kind of introduce yourself and thank you again for covering for oleg last time while we were trying to arrange um connection with them yeah that's great it's great to meet everybody this evening i was about 15 minutes late so long day at work um you know just that's just the way it is sometimes uh hubless propulsions kind of became my uh, my side gig so uh, Oleg, uh, Alan, just to kind of supplement what you guys did, three years ago, I did a, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to say this the right way so I don't get in trouble. I did some work for the Navy in Mississippi uh, on a vehicle for them. Alan, the word you were groping for was cavitation. So in the air, we worry about vibrations. In the water, we worry about cavitations. Sure. You will find with hubless propulsion that if you're good with your blade design, you can also tune for frequency. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work with John Hall as of late up at AFRL, and we've had some pretty uh, interesting results come back on the work that we've been doing on multiple sizes of uh, hubless blades and fans. Um, we Ron has a video. I don't know if he can go and grab it that he can play. Um, that shows uh, my four inch up and running at 18,000 RPM. Uh, and it does have a thin section bearing in it. And um, you are outside the uh, uh, the manufacturer suggested spec. Um, we have blown up quite a few thin section bearings uh, through the research. Um, I've built two different style ring motors at the 14 inch. Uh, oh, look, I don't know which one you saw. One was a fallout from the GHO program from about eight years ago that NASA still has and runs. Um, in fact, actually, Tim was on our team um, and was kind of our aero go-to guy. Tim Street, he's on this call. So, Tim, the one you were afraid to spin anymore, uh, uh, Ron and his family uh, and Aliyah, you guys were there and saw that one. Uh, at my facility when I was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and Tim was scared to death of it because we were starting to get micro cracks um, in between the Hallbach array magnets. And NASA took that thing and they've been just knocking the snot out of it for about the past eight years. Um, so NASA has that one. And then I built two more 14 inchers um, for Boeing. 
because we were uh, on the team with Boeing on Aquifer before NASA in their brilliance decided to cancel that, that, uh, that whole initiative. Um, we were on the LHO program. So uh, we, that's where we built the four inch and the five inch hubless propulsors. Both of those got through bench testing, but they did not get to the wind tunnel because Boeing uh, essentially decided to go with a traditional electric ducted fan, um, which was probably a good choice because uh, they, they had to fly something. <laughs> yeah, there's the old, that's, that's an 11 incher. And I, um, I realized so that, Mark, that, Mark Moore is in there. Mark's on the call too. Mark, that was the last time I think we saw you was in Kentucky with, yeah, with yeah, Bobby. Well, yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of yeah, time the bridge. <laughs> yeah. And, hey, Olick, uh, I see that you went to Irvine. So I just moved from SoCal. So we got some SoCal heritage there, baby. I was living in Tustin. So just just by the dirigible uh, uh, airfield, the old Marine Corps base. So yeah, the fires got to you, so you had to move out. Well, you know, the University of Chinese Immigration was getting kind of thick, right? You, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, I worked down in Costa Mesa. So yeah. I had that, you know, that 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 terrible five mile commute down Red Hill. <laughs> I didn't have to. I didn't have to deal with the five or anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually. From the beach. I'm actually the same. I, 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 I'm actually the same. I lived in uh, Mission Viejo, um, not far from there, right by the El Toro Marine Base, uh, for about half of my life, and before I moved to the East Coast and and uh, got married and moved uh, to Florida for some reason. <laughs> Well, that's okay, yeah. man. From one littoral area to another, right? Hey, guys, um, I don't want to cut cool. off the conversation, but I do want to say that it is 7 o'clock my time. Um, and those of you that might be either super early or in Germany and it's like 2 o'clock or something, um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Um, if you don't, you're welcome to step out. And then those of you that want to kind of stay back, Oleg, and kind of talk, um, you guys are welcome to stay. This is uh, Rob Thompson. I had a question. I wanted to ask if uh, on the rim itself, you might make a track and uh, fill that with uh, some synthetic oil and then um, have it pressurized uh, rather than using the bearings. That seems to be the weakest point here. Uh, the guy previously speaking said that uh, they went out past the manufacturer's tolerance. So I wonder if you thought, um, you know, if it was floating and you kept it within a track and pressurized it, if that may uh, alleviate some of the problems you're having with the degradation of the Teflon and the bearings and all that issue. Definitely. Um, yep. Oh, go ahead. Yep. I'll let you we go first. We I'll definitely like... thought of that, yeah. So uh, we're waiting right now um, on both the four and the five inch to do an air bearing um, design and experiment so that, you know, we can focus on the motor topology um, and get some of the wind down out of that. I also have been working with uh, some folks up at MIT on a carbon fiber wire so we can take mass out of the ring motors. Um, so that's, that's out there pending. Um, and then, uh, we, I tried foil bearings and we couldn't get them to engage properly. So, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's still a viable, I wouldn't say it's been fully explored. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that, that was out there. Uh, the thin section bearings, you're always going to have the bearing chatter. Now, uh, when I did a, anechoic chamber test uh, with these ring motors and the uh, propulsors, the Owen Corning's guys were able to characterize the mechanical noise and pull that out so that we could get the pure uh, air acoustic noise. Um, so that's, that's something. I have found for ring motor design and architecture, even the Katea software is not really good, the electric motor software that they have, the module. So uh, we've, me and Mark, my other researcher, we've uh, kind of built our own in-house uh, electric motor software. 
actually Tim kind of started on that years ago and then it just kind of died out and we found we had to go back to it. Um, the motor manufacturing folks, you know, they don't, don't use a lot of the low torque, high RPM. Um, and then the blade design that we had, I wanted to let everybody know, um, our point designs was four tenths, because Tim was asking, four tenths mock, uh, two to three pounds of thrust at sea level static, and 10 to 11 pounds of thrust at 40 knots. And so on the 16,000 and 24,000 RPM tests, uh, we produced at 24,000, we were producing 12 pounds of thrust, sea level static, and uh, at uh, right about the 12,000 mark is when we started seeing about two pounds of thrust. Uh, below that, we weren't, we weren't generating enough. And, and I've started to focus a lot now on mass, mass of the whole system. So it buys its way on board. Um, we still haven't gotten good calculations on electron draw. You know, you, you run your your 6S batteries down pretty fast. So if you're looking for an hour flight, you, you got to have a lot of power available. I was thinking more like uh, ceramic booting um, inside of a uh, an alloy track uh, pumped with oil. And so that um, you're actually not... Um, you know, creating too much friction. If uh, it's a water application, I mean, uh, weight's no problem, but uh, you know, in the air, you're always mindful of uh, the materials that you're using for lightweight. And, you know, we couldn't have a pump in there, but I think you could uh, seal it up pretty well um, if it was like, you know, riding in a track. Yeah, Rob, um, and again, I'm, because of who the customer was in Mississippi, but the prototype that we put together, we actually drove that hydraulically under the water line. And then, and then above is where we kept the electronics, um, just so that we didn't have to spend a lot of money on sealing containers. Yeah, ideally that would work, uh, but like in the air, like I said, if it was uh, sealed up in some manner. I'm just trying to get away from the uh, link, uh, weakest link there and uh, with the friction and whatnot and the noise. I mean, that's the, the general reason you're creating. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. The, the, the long pole in the tent has always been, and it's still there is that mechanical bearing uh, issue. When you're generating, you know, 10 pounds of thrust, you, you've got to hold back that fan because she wants to take off down the duct. So you've got an axial and then you can't suffer a rotor strike, right? And there is a little bit of rotor bloom at the higher RPMs uh, on all of the materials that we've used and experimented with um, for the rotors. Um, and so you've got a radial issue that you've got to address as well and 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 those are the two you know a rotor strike or a rotor takeoff are the two things that you fight you've got to kind of keep it inside that cage um just so that you guys know we were bouncing again on the eight uh blade design at four and a half inches we were bouncing all around 60 db so uh, a lot of promise there a lot of promise um yeah we'd uh um, all, all really interesting stuff. Um, the uh, the blade design that we saw um, that you showed of the uh, the ten inch uh, propulsor uh, that uh, it had some interesting louvers on it. I uh, was was some of that for increased surface area as well as just acoustic signature. It was all acoustic signature. That work came out of believe it or not the research of whale bumps. Mm -hmm. So you've got you've got flow control and then and then you got the separation off of the blades. And we found that those serrations um, are very, very helpful. And it was a, a significant DB down um, from any kind of twist blades. And what I got to add is we worked with. Uh, oh, golly, I can't think of his name right off the top of my head right now. Um, but Chris. I think it's Shao Pan, Dr. Shao Pan at NASA. And he came up Wasn't with out of X rotor a salad spoon kind of blade. So we're really interested to see what the I think it's going to be tonal, but uh, we're really interested to see what that looks like when that comes back. But uh, you'll see on the pictures that Ron has that I just sent, we've got some interesting tip uh, changes, um, and that, and that believe it or not was some of the stuff we learned out of the uh, water cavitation too. It doesn't directly transcend to air, but but when you're just focusing on acoustics, um, there's some interesting things you can do. My fear is is that uh, you put too much twist in in these inverse tapers, 
and you you start getting into some real stall issues when you look at the blade segments and you know like anything else the airplane the airplane's gonna because it's a single stage the airplane's gonna fight do you want to be good at takeoff or do you want to be good at cruise and then you got to design design to that 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 point um tim worked on it i've worked on it we use like a bastardized version of x rotor and it and it does give some some pretty good 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 results um so that's that's some more food for thought if you guys wanted to go down that 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 pattern and when you talk to the propeller guys it's always fun because your blade element theory guys are going to argue with your disc optimization theory guys so you know which formula are you going to use <laughs> but you know getting that board and you can isolate the mechanical noise you know one thing that i think uh where where i think we could really help and i'd, I'd like to help um any of you that are looking for um you know materials uh you know, processing uh and tooling help with these kinds of projects um i i feel like we could probably offer you at least uh one constant that you have in your your modeling that you're doing uh, where uh, we can help you with the appropriate materials where you're going to have the least amount of deflection you'll get a reduced uh, acoustic signature just by going with better materials that are more appropriate for what you're doing and um, and just create a constant at least amongst your experiments so that you're um, you, you know you don't add that variable to each model of having different materials and different um components that may may be a factor in uh your behavioral modeling um i think that would my, my gut feeling is that would help a lot um we would you know we're we're interested in um you know participating in things like this uh with any of you all um in uh possibly licensing it for projects that we're already on um you know we have a number of customers that um pay their bills for this kind of stuff you can say and uh we work on everything from uh, a missile program to um uh we've designed uh nine different drones uh that are vertical takeoff and fixed wing um and uh and then we do uh foiling watercraft as well so we, we do all sorts of um products that would uh benefit both flying and uh you know in both air and water so uh, we we uh, are very, very interested in that and uh, kind of pushing the boundaries of what some of the materials can do. And we work with the most exotic materials in the world, I can tell you. We uh, we have air scrubbers in our factory um, that change our air five, six times an hour. We work with all the different nano materials, um, uh, CNT, CNF, uh, graphene, graphene oxide. Um, you know, all different types of carbon fiber, both thermoplastic and thermoset materials, by the way. We, we do about um, half and half, um, and, and also some that are hybridized and even ones that can be inductively welded. So uh, we, we work with some pretty weird stuff. Yeah, Alan, we, we definitely need to talk in Olog. Um, I, I put this out last time, Olog. Uh, the, February is the suspension for a call for papers. Uh, I think a joint paper um would be excellent uh based on kind of maybe uh capitalizing on both of our research and and you know trying to formulate a team um one of the other points i wanted to bring out because you know i said we're using bastardized x rotor and we've got you know tools built in matlab or tools built in excel um we're, we're really at a point uh across the board with a lot of this where validated tools and validated modeling is is huge right we we really need that because the 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 subject of hubless propulsion is a systems issue you've got various components that feed into that but you know you it's an mdo exercise because you've got electrical arrow and and some mechanical based on how we optimize that out um my poor mechanical engineer brethren but um, you know, and then you got material science, Alan. You know, dead in the middle of all of this, because some of that material also for your ducting can also be acoustic mitigation as well. 
So, uh, you know, I really think we could put together an impressive team and, and try and go forward for six years now. I think Ron can attest. I have begged DARPA, begged IARPA, been at AFRL, been at NRL, you know, poor researcher, please feed me. And, you know, it's sexy stuff, but not really sexy. And been with Boeing, but I got on board with Boeing and finally stole some of their IRAD money. And then they had the 737 MAX debacle, right? So all IRAD dried up and went away. But uh, so, um, you know, uh, had a little tish with Lockheed Martin. That was painful. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, two times down, you know, two dances with NASA and we just got going and then, uh, senior NASA management said, eh, it's not sexy enough and canceled the program. So, uh, you know, I'm a big believer, but I'm very biased, but I, I really think that chasing quiet flight and, and I think at some scale hubless provided we can solve some of these hoops and they're big hoops. You know, I don't want to oversell this thing. I mean, there's, there may be a brick wall out there and we just don't know it. The physics right now is telling us this is hot shit and this is a new way to fly. But, you know, it's just not there. I think Rich Allett's on board. He's been studying conceptually this kind of stuff and distributed propulsion for like 20 something years. And, you know, everybody tells me, yeah, it's right there. And then when you say, well, we need about a million dollars, they go, ah. And then that's the end of the conversation. Well, it sounds like you need a defense lobbyist to go in there and wrangle away the money from them. That's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Rob. Yeah, I need one of them, uh, uh, you know, high-speed, low-drag defense contractor marketing guys that knows all the lobbyists. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, you didn't hear my introduction. Like, uh, I've been a lobbyist for five years, and uh, I have contacts at the Office of Secretary. DARPA, one of my uh, college roommates, a comptroller. I have all the people that you possibly would need if we have a great white paper I can get shot though. Oh yeah, I just briefed all, of, when Dr. Honey was the deputy director, Ron was on board, uh, I think it was about maybe six, seven months ago. It's while we were all stuck in closets with the zombie apocalypse. I briefed all the senior DARPA leadership and they said, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but you're not tied to an airplane. And if you can't achieve first flight in uh, a seedling program, then you know we're gonna have to pass you off. Um, hey, like, guys, oh my gosh, I gotta not fly. To, not to cut you guys all off, I actually have to go because I have another meeting in 45 minutes. So I'm gonna jump off. If you guys want to continue here, I'll just leave this call open. Um, but I'm gonna be jumping off, and I just wanted to thank everyone, especially Oleg, for the presentation and for everybody else to be here and hear the presentation and the discussion has been great. So if you guys want to carry it on here, you're welcome to, or if you want to just take it offline and, and you, you have each other's emails, I think Oleg, you've got Alan and Bobby's contact information as well as Mark's and everybody else on the call. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Ron will be happy to make all the connections that you guys want anyway. Um, but I'm going to have to jump off and kind of give my brain a break for a little while um, before I get on the phone call. Thank you. For, yeah, thank you. Thank you for organizing you. that. Of course. Yeah, it was it was great. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. And uh, yeah, any of you all that want to stay on a bit, um, I I could actually grab a couple of parts to show you some examples of some of the kind of crazy things that we mold. Um, unfortunately, some of the really insane stuff, I can't show you all of it, but. Okay, um, in that case, Alan, I'm going to make you the organizer as I jump out, okay? <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good All night. Right, Bye, Aaliyah. I appreciate it, Aaliyah. Thank right. you very Bye. much. Good seeing you guys. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye. -bye. All right. Let's see. Alan. Oleg, are you in?